In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. In this epistle of St. Paul, um, we're at the very beginning of the church, obviously. Uh, St. Paul has recently founded the church in the city of Corinth, which was a pretty corrupt city, it being a port, a Greek port at that time. But Corinth still exists today, obviously. Um, and he says, I make known unto you the gospel, uh, for I delivered unto you, first of all, what I also received. That quotation, I delivered unto you, well, first of all, what I also received, was on, inscribed on the grave by the Archbishop of First Choice, was inscribed on his grave. In other words, he invented nothing. Uh, he didn't create the Catholic faith. He was not combating Rome in the name of some Lutheran invention or post-Lutheran invention. He was simply handing down what he himself had received, which is exactly what St. Paul says here. In other words, St. Paul is saying, I didn't invent what I've been giving you. I received it from God, uh, and, uh, and that's the authority behind what I give you, gave you. And it's not, he might have said, 12 op uh, 10 options, it's 10 commandments. The whole modern world thinks that the commandments are some kind of option. They can choose in or out of this one true Catholic faith, whether they like, well, however so they like. Terrible illusion. Um, there's only one true Saviour, one true Redeemer, and one true faith. Uh, St. Paul says it explicitly in, in Ephesians. Uh, here it is in, implicitly in Corinthians. And it's by this faith that souls can be saved, and by no other. No more by the Jewish faith, which of, let's say of Moses, which was, Moses was the best of the Old Testament. Moses and the other, and the other real heroes of the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Solomon, Samuel, David, uh, M Moses. That was a true religion which only existed in order to prepare the way for the New Testament. And the New Testament is so quoted and foreseen and foreshadowed and mentioned and prophesied in the Old Testament that when the Jews, after the Jews crucified Jesus Christ, the Jews had to change the text of the Old Testament in order to cut out as much as possible the references to our Lord Jesus Christ and to the New Testament to come. And they invented their own new false Talmudic religion. And instead of the Old Testament, the Old Testament was the book of Moses and the true heroes of the Old Testament preparing the New Testament. But the book of the, the sacred book of the Talmudic modern Jews is no longer the Old Testament. They don't know the Old Testament. I can remember talking in, in, the, in the United States with a good man, uh, a rabbi, uh, a, young, a youngish rabbi. And he had been West Point, the tradition of West Point, the American Military Academy in, over in the eastern United States, uh, in the state of New York, I do believe. The traditions of West Point, the mere tradition of West Point, encouraged him to look into his Jewish tradition and going into his Jewish rabbinic tradition, Talmudic, he made himself, he became a rabbi, a minister of this religion, the modern religion of the Jews. And he was not a bad man, um, but he had a bad religion. And he, he, was, he had not received the gift of belief in Christ, of his own race, of his own people, the, the true Messiah of his people and his race. That gift he had not received, and it is a gift from God, the true faith. We can't pull it down by ourselves. We can ask God for it. We cannot pull it down. We do not have the strength or means or ability or force or supernatural force to pull down these great gifts of God, faith, hope, and charity. 
All three are a gift of God, a supernatural gift of God, which can only come from God. And he had not yet given um, the grace of the faith to this youngish rabbi. Please think of saying a prayer for him, Rabbi Shiva, uh, because his goodwill was so considerable and his apparent good faith that uh, he should be Catholic and he might be. Mystery of God, mystery of free will, mystery that you and I have no handle on at all, except that we can pray to God, to ask God to give him this grace to this rabbi. Anyway, in conversation with the rabbi, it was clear that he had not much knowledge of the Old Testament. I knew the Old Testament better than he did, which, if the Old Testament was still the holy book of the Jews, would certainly not have been the case. So, um, the, 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 it's a new religion. The, the, the Jewish religion today is a completely new religion, blocking out Jesus Christ, and in fact hating Jesus Christ. And the Talmud blasphemes Jesus Christ and his Holy Mother in several places. It's, it's, a, it's a tissue of blasphemies against, Christ, against Christ and the church that Christ created. So, um, here is St. Paul. Um, Christ died according to the scriptures, and then he's got a very brief creed. You can see this is the, the seeds of the Apostles' Creed. Um, soon after St. Paul says this, they will have elab the Apostles will have elaborated uh, what the creed we all of us recite uh, in Mass. Uh, which is, the, no, I'm sorry, beg your pardon. The, Apostle, the creed we recite in Mass is the Nicene Creed, which is still more elaborated, but the first version of the Nicene Creed was the Apostles' Creed, and the first version, the, the raw material of the Apostles' Creed was what here Apostle Paul sketches out in brief. I had delivered unto you, first, first of all, which I had also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. This is the essence of, of, of the creed. And that he was buried, and that he rose again from the, 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 the third day, according to the scriptures. Now that is normally a preposterous claim that a corpse can rise from the dead. But that he was seen to Cephas, he rose the third day according to the scriptures, he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and after that by the eleven apostles. Then he was seen by more than 500 brethren all at once, of whom many remain until this present. They're still alive, but some have fallen asleep. They've either fallen away from their faith or they've died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me, uh, as, one, as by one born out of time, due time, as, um, and he compels himself <laughs> to an abortion. It's just like, like somebody aborted, so not even normally, normally born, but... Uh, for I am the least of the apostles, he's pretty humble, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God before his conversion as Saul, of course. He was a bitter enemy of the Christians. He was an enthusiastic Judaic or follower of the Jewish religion, which seemed to be the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but was in fact the religion of, of Annas and Caiaphas, which is already a different religion. If the Jews at the time of Christ had really been children, as, as our Lord, divine Lord says in the Gospel of John, if the Jews at our Lord's time had really been the spiritual children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would never have crucified our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what our Lord says. But they're not really sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, that was just a pretense, spiritually and in reality. They were children of, of and they were on, they were with Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests that that, crucif that presided over and pushed for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so St. Paul adduces the the physical evidence of the resurrection, and it gains the essence of the creed that Christ was crucified. That he was a man. A, a, a normal man, a child of a human woman, that he lived for 33 years. He doesn't mention that detail. He doesn't need these details. He, he's mentioning simply the essential. But this is the essential. 
that he did live as a normal human being, that he did die as a normal human being would die when he's crucified with three nails on a wooden cross. All of these physical details, evidence. St. Paul leaves out the, 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 the details, but he's, he's quoting the evidence. And, and he did rise from the dead. He was seen by, and then a long list, starting with uh, Kephas, Actually, the first person that our Lord showed, the risen Lord showed himself to, was of course his mother. But that's another story. So he doesn't mention that here. What he mentions is he appeared to, to Kephas simply because Kephas was Peter, the head of the church. After that, actually, before Peter saw the risen Lord, Mary Magdalene, two women, his own mother and Mary Magdalene, saw our Lord. But, he mentions the apparition to Kephas as though it was first Kephas because of the authority and position of Peter in the church. But after that, by the 11 apostles, then by more than 500 brethren, of whom, etc., etc., then he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was also seen by me. And then it's noteworthy what he says at the end. I am the least of the apostles, who so I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but... By the grace of God, I am what I am. So, so it, it wasn't he that made himself an apostle. It was God that made him an apostle. And his, but, says St. Paul, I am what I am. I, I, he, he is actually the second prince of the two princes of the church, the two princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul. He comes second after Peter because the, the, Peter is the head, but he comes immediately after because as Peter was the, Paul, the apostle of the Jews, so Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. And he founded the church of Corinth and he founded all of, all of the churches mentioned in scripture to which he wrote letters and many, many other churches undoubtedly as well. But notice what he f finishes. By the grace of God I am what I am. Therefore it's the grace of God. However, he finally says, his grace in me hath not been vain void. In other words, somebody like St. Paul is made, the, the, a great servant of God is a great servant of God by the grace of God. On the other hand, that grace has not, has not been void in that whoever it is, well, in that servant of God. Therefore, uh, it's a combination of the grace of God and the free choice of cooperating with the grace of God instead of refusing the grace of God. St. Francis Xavier said, uh, if only men knew what they would, what he would make of them if they let him. <laughs> In other words, a lot of us block the will of God, block the grace of God, because we don't want to be made into what God would and could make of us if only we were willing to go with and not oppose the grace of God. Therefore, um, St. Paul is a great apostle, one of the two princes of the apostles, by the grace of God, not by himself, by the gift of God. On the other hand, St. Paul had to cooperate with the grace of God in order to be turned from Saul into uh, the great uh, apostle of the Gentiles. And you may remember, the story of Paul's conversion is in the Acts of the Apostles, and there, um, St. Paul's first reaction, when he's knocked off his horse and he's blinded, Lord, what do you want me to do? What will you have me do? Immediately recognized Jesus Christ, immediately believed as only his... Jewish training, his top-class Jewish training with Gamaliel, a great teacher amongst the, amongst the Jews, and who did finally convert after some years after the crucifixion and death of our Lord. Gamaliel did convert. He's in the martyrology, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, and he had pu Paul had been a pupil of Gamaliel. He had learned, he had learned and soaked in the very best of the Old Testament, and he's constantly quoting Isaiah. Isaiah seems to be his favorite amongst the books of the, of the Old Testament. He's constantly quoting. It's maybe because Isaiah is one of the books which most 
foreshadows and foretells of uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah to come. In any case, uh, St. Paul has soaked into his bones all of the truth and wisdom of the Old Testament. Well, not all, but a good, good part. And that's what obviously enabled him to confront the Jews and to refute the Jews when he made those very first missionary journeys. And the Jews couldn't answer him, which is why he was persecuted, seriously persecuted, um, through those missionary journeys. He tells the story, uh, at least partly in the second epistle of the Corinthians. This comes from the first, the end of the first. And uh, he says he was shipwrecked, he was flogged, he was thrashed, he was betrayed, he went through it all. But he says, God kept me going. God kept me going through all of this persecution and all of these miseries. Glory be to God, that's all he would have said at the end of it. Glory be to God. So he, but he was willing to go on being thrashed, shipwrecked, and persecuted, and so on, and so betrayed, if that's what God wanted. And that's why he was such a great apostle. And you may remember also from the Acts of the Apostles, when Saul is converted to Paul, and uh, he's blinded at the moment of his conversion, he, at the moment of being knocked off his horse, he's blinded to signify his spiritual blindness. And our Lord reserves for him to be cured of his blindness by one of the Christians in, in Damascus where he was going, where, where Paul was headed to, in order to persecute the Christians. And now he's got to see one of the, the older members of the new Christian congregation in, in Damascus, and that's that by name Ananias. And Ananias, when our Lord says, I want you to go and cure Paul, what? Him? Ananias can't believe what I was telling him, but he does, Ananias does cure Paul of his blindness. And um, from then on, he does a seminary on his own, instructed by God in the desert for three years, soon after that. And then he's fit to preach Christ and to refute the Jews who are persecuting the, 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 um, the new church of, of Christ. Um, and viciously persecuting it, because, says St. Paul in one of his epistles, Thessalonians, he says, they, out of Jesse, they don't, not only do they not want to be saved themselves, but they don't want anybody else to be saved. So they're going to stop if they can. This was the Jews from the very beginning of the Christianity. They're going to stop Christianity if they can, the following of Christ if they can, and St. Paul says, because they don't want anybody else to be saved. This dog's in the manger. They bark at the cows coming. The dogs don't themselves eat the food of the cows, but they so bark at the cows that the cows can't get at what they want and need to eat. So the dogs in the manger are not eating themselves, but they're also depriving other animals of eating. So the Jews are not only not wanting to be saved themselves, they're also intent, and they've been intent for 2,000 years, on blocking any souls being, being saved by, by Jesus Christ and by Christianity. And that's the history of the last 2,000 years. The struggle between Almighty God and his agents, main agents, obviously, his Catholic Church, his, the church of his Catholic Church, and um, the devil and his main agents, who are the Jews because of their choice, their own choice, and it's a choice of which today the large part of them are proud, they're actually proud of the way in which they hate and persecute the, the Catholic Church. So it's not something they're ashamed of, something they're proud of. Heaven help them. Again, they need a gentle prayer from ourselves, I say, say because again, like Ananias, we would say, you don't, want us, you, you don't want us to pray for those people, do you, Lord? Well, yes, yes he does. He does. She does want us to pray for them. Because they can't, they're incapable of praying to Christ by themselves. And everything depends upon our Lord Jesus Christ. Through his mother, they can't pray for themselves. Who is going to pray for them? That any of them be saved. They all can be saved. They all have human souls. They're all, they all have free will. They're using that free will to persecute the church. If only, imagine what the Catholic Church would have been if, with their talents, with their God-given talents, 
They had served the church, as a few of them have done, and outstandingly. Um, the, the head of the Holy Ghost Fathers, the re-founder, the founder of the Holy Ghost Fathers in the, in the 19th century, a great missionary congregation, was a, the son of a rabbi, and Jewish by race, but Catholic by faith. He wrote a very fine commentary on the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of St. John. I uh, forget his name. It was Francis, Francis Lieberman, that was his name. Um, a Frenchman and um, a Jew. So uh, St. Paul had that Jewish learning through Gamaliel and the grace of conversion and his own free cooperation through years and years, tens of years, through shipwrecks and betrayals and all kinds of hardships and sufferings, because, I was going to quote, when our Lord was speaking to Ananias to tell him to go and liberate Paul from his blindness, and Ananias was a bullshit. The old man was completely astonished, but he did, he did what our Lord asked him. He said, I want you to tell him, I want you, Ananias, to tell him what he is going to suffer for my sake. Not enjoy and fulfill himself and be famous and all of this. No, 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 no. Go, I want you to tell him what he's going to have to suffer. If he's going to be a great apostle, he's going to have great sufferings. So, it's the way of the cross. And that's how it is today. And undoubtedly, Almighty God is planning events. He's in command. It's not the Jews who are in command. They think they're in command, but they aren't. They, it's God who's in command. Just like the suicide thinks he's in command at the moment of his death when he pulls the trigger, but Almighty God can make the trigger not work, or he can make the bullet stop halfway down the barrel. Almighty God is the master. He's the master. And so it's, it's God who chooses the moment when this poor suicide, if he finally succeeds in committing suicide, he may have tried a few times, like many of them. Uh, if he finally commits suicide, it's, uh, it's, it's a decision of God. There's nothing more to be done for the poor man. He is insistent, or woman, he or she is insistent upon taking their own lives. I've stopped it a few times. May the Almighty God may well have prevented the suicide from actually happening for two or three, four times. I don't know, obviously. But uh, it's God who is the master of the suicide's moment of death and not the suicide himself, not even the suicide himself. God is the master. And therefore, God is the master of events today and not his enemies. Uh, he only, they can only do what he allows them to do. And if he allows the, uh, his enemies today to inflict a great deal of suffering, which looks like what's going to happen, um, another disease, very possible, famine, very possible, economic crash, practically certain, um, currencies worth nothing, just paper, our, our, our banknotes at the moment worth nothing more than paper, very probable. Uh, and, and his enemies think they have it all under control and it's all going to work out their way. They can do nothing that God does not allow. And God knows exactly what he's choosing to allow. And what he's allowing is for our salvation. And so he's going to allow a great deal of suffering because only suffering is going to get through to this wicked generation. Because as Solzhenitsyn said, I, don't, I can't quote the exact words, but the sense is this. Modern man is covered in a shell of concrete. He's built a shell of concrete around himself, which is going to take the crowbar of suffering to smash. And that's very true. That's a true picture of the state of modern man. He's built like a tortoise shell of concrete, a bunker to shut out God, to shut out God. And he's leading his little life, his, his miserable little life inside his miserable shell, <laughs> and it's going to be a mercy of God when he takes a crowbar of suffering to smash that shell and put many, many, many souls back in contact with the reality of their life, with the reality of why they are here to go to heaven, with the reality of how, 
however wicked they may have been, they can still choose to save their souls if they wish, but Almighty God is not going to force them. He is going to give them again, all of them, the chance by making all of us suffer, but it will be a free will choice whether people choose after the suffering to go to God or not. It's still going to be their choice. We have um, interesting times ahead of us, um, my dear friends. Pray steadily, it's, I always say it and it's always necessary. Pray steadily the rosary. It's very interesting, there has appealed, appealed just recently by some dit, some male dit, some male idiot. Uh, the, rosary is a, the rosary is a weapon of terrorism or something like with, of, of, I forget exactly how it puts it, but, but uh, blind, such blindness. But it's interesting, it's, it just, it's an idiotic article, but it's interesting that it gets written because it shows the, the power of the rosary. He doesn't pick on the, the, the followers of Christ writing articles in the newspaper or this or that or the other. He picks on those praying the rosary. The rosary is... And he's dead right. The rosary is a, a great weapon, but it's not a weapon of bad or evil or, or harm to himself, the writer of that article. If only he could receive the grace to start praying the rosary, he would, he would understand a stack of, he would understand a stack of things, but, but he's, he's blinded. Will he stay blinded? At least he's not lukewarm. At least he's attacking the, the, the people praying the rosary. That, that's, that's better for Almighty God than lukewarmness. So many souls today just completely indifferent. Religion just doesn't matter. Oh, it's a nice thing. I'm all for it for my grandmother and my children or my grandchildren. I'm all for it, but really it doesn't, doesn't concern me. I'm a follower of science. Ah, oh, you poor man. You are loaded with pride, and your pride will take you to hell if you aren't careful. My dear friends, pray the rosary in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.